Good morning and welcome to the 10th meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2019. Can I ask everyone in the room please to ensure that mobile phones are off or on silent? <coughs> Agenda items 1, 2 and 3 are consideration of an instrument relating to the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018, the Cross-Border Healthcare EU Exit Scotland Amendment Regulations 2019 in draft. The purpose of, these instru of this instrument is to amend the NHS Scotland Act 1978 and the NHS Cross-Border Healthcare Scotland Regulations 2013. The changes remedy deficiencies in retained e uh, EU law relating to cross-border healthcare in circumstances where the U UK leaves the EU without a withdrawal agreement in place. This instrument provides a mechanism for ensuring there is no interruption to healthcare arrangements for people accessing healthcare through EU Directive 2011-24 uh, after exit day in those EEA member states that agree to maintain current arrangements with the UK for a transitional period until the end of 2020. We will first of all consider the categorisation of the instrument. Members will be familiar with the uh, basis on which this is done. Uh, and the Scottish Government have laid the SSI uh, under the mandatory affirmative procedure. Legal advice suggests that a SIF should have been applied, but that had it been applied, the affirmative procedure would have emerged in any case. So ultimately, the practical effect would be the same. Uh, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee considered this instrument on the 19th of March and agreed that it had been appropriately categorised as medium. Uh, the committee draws the attention uh, of the Parliament to the instrument under the general reporting ground uh, on the basis of a minor error and calls on the Scottish Government to correct this error at the next legislative opportunity. Uh, as I say, it has been assessed as medium um, because of uh, the way in which it is uh, the impact of it. Are members content with that categorisation? Yes. If we are all agreed, uh, I will, we will therefore uh, move on to agenda item two. Uh, which is an evidence session uh, with, his, with the Minister and his officials on the instrument. Uh, and once we have had our questions answered, we will then move to agenda item three, the formal debate on the motion. So, uh, may I welcome to the committee Joe Fitzpatrick, Minister for Public Health, Sport and Wellbeing, uh, along with John Brunton, Senior Policy Manager, uh, and John Patterson, Solicitor from the Legal Directorate of the Scottish Government. Welcome, uh, gentlemen. Uh, Minister, I believe you want to make a brief opening statement. Yes, on this um, thank you, Convener. So, pleased to join you this morning to discuss these regulations. It's the Scottish Government's clear position that the interests of Scotland will be best served by remaining within the European Union, and recent events in Whitehall have only served to strengthen that view. However, as a responsible government, we have a duty to make necessary preparations to ensure that the Scottish statute book remains operable to help to mitigate the considerable damage a no deal Brexit would cause. At present, under the European Cross-Border Healthcare Directive, European Economic Area citizens have the right to obtain healthcare services in other EEA countries. However, the treatment must be the same as or equivalent to the treatment that is provided by the state in their country of affiliation. The patient um, pays for the treatment up front and may claim reimbursement, limited to the amount of the treatment would, cause, would cost had it been provided by the, the state at home in, in Scotland on the NHS. As health is devolved, the National Health Service Cross-Border Healthcare Scotland Regulations 2013 implemented the directive in Scotland where necessary. The regulations uh, provide a legal basis for NHS to apply the need for prior authorisation for expensive specialist treatment. They also limit the amount of reimbursement to the actual cost of the, that the NHS had the treatment been provided here. Importantly, the home state retains responsibility for the healthcare it finds on a cross-border basis. If the treatment is not available on the NHS in Scotland, you cannot use the directive to receive it in another EEA country and claim reimbursement from the NHS on return. The Cross-Border Healthcare EU Exit Scotland Amendments etc. Regulations 2019 are taken from powers um, in the European Withdrawal Act 2018. They correct deficiencies which would arise from the UK's withdrawal from the EU uh, without a deal by modifying the 2013 regulations. England, Wales and Northern Ireland are introducing similar regulations. The instrument protects patients in a transitional um, position and enables continuation of cross-border healthcare arrangements in those countries with whom the UK has established continued 
reciprocal arrangements, maintaining the provisions in the directive that gives EEA citizens the choice to travel for healthcare. Maintaining effective access to cross-border healthcare abroad requires basic uh, reciprocal agreements to ensure that the existing EU framework is maintained in participating countries. Therefore, the instrument terminates access to cross-border healthcare with countries where there is no longer a, a, a reciprocal agreement. As reciprocal healthcare arrangements are applied on a UK-wide basis, the Secretary of State for Health will maintain a list of countries that reach agreement to maintain the current reciprocal arrangements with the UK until the 31st of December 2020. The instrument protects, so far as possible, key groups of patients in a transitional situation on exit day, irrespective of any re reciprocal agree agreement in place. For example, individuals who obtain prior authorisation for planned treatment before exit day, but have not yet obtained treatment. Individuals who accessed healthcare abroad prior to exit day, but have not yet completed the, the treatment or sought reimbursement and UK state pensioners from Scotland living in other EEA countries who need to access health care provided by the NHS while in Scotland. These time-limited measures aim to prevent, so far as is possible, without reciprocal agreements, a sudden loss of overseas health care rights to, for Scottish residents and pensioners and uh, from Scotland residing in the EEA. We consider the amendments to be technical for uh, the most part, I hope that members will agree that as, as part of the Scottish Government's overall prog programme of legislative contingency planning for Brexit, the cross-border healthcare EU exit Scotland amendments, etc., regulations 2019 provide necessary changes to protect Scottish residents' rights to access cross-border healthcare in other EEA countries as far as that can be achieved. And, of course, we're happy to um, answer questions. Thank you very much, Minister. And you mentioned... Uh, continued reciprocal arrangements with other countries in the European Economic Area. I wonder if it's possible to update the committee on which countries the UK government has made progress in, in reaching such agreements with. So um, we're not aware of any formal bilateral agreements as yet, but understand that um, uh, some EE countries have agreed in principle um, um, to uh, reciprocal agreements. But I think that Spain is the only country which has made that public and, um, and uh, as I understand, have drafted regulations. However, it should be made clear that the European Commission has said that it considers discussions um, in the second phase of the negotiations to be the appropriate way to reach agreement on the future of reciprocal health care and has indicated it does, does not encourage bilateral agreements at this time. So in spite of the fact that there's uh, indications from um, Spain in particular, um, there, there could be a hiatus um, if, if, um, at, at, that, at that point. So the, the cross-border health care amendments regulations will protect uh, Scots who have travelled for treatment but have yet to receive it or um, who have received treatment and are seeking reimbursement in, in that intervening period. Clearly in relation to the European Union uh, in the expectation on the EU's part that there will be a withdrawal agreement, it's understandable that the, the European Commission does not wish to promote the concept of bilateral agreements at this stage, but given in the absence of an agreement, which is clearly a possibility against which this regulation is designed, in the absence of an agreement, then uh, immediately on exit day, whichever day that might be, these arrangements that currently exist would cease, and therefore bilateral arrangements would be required, would they not, uh, for for UK citizens abroad? I think I think, I think there is a, there is a um, clearly a, a, a willingness from Spain. Um, that, that that should happen, and as I understand, as I said, I think the regulations are um, already drafted. However, um, I think the, the view from the European Commission is that, irrespective sure. of what the outcome is, that any reciprocal agreement should be pan-European. So I think there's 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 maybe two two different views coming coming from Europe just now, um, which is why I think it's important that we put in, in place. Um, and, and, and understanding that point and recognising that the EEA includes a number of countries such as Norway and Switzerland, which are not members of the European Union, presumably progress on bilateral arrangements with those countries, uh, Norway obviously being very important to Scotland from uh, an oil industry perspective. In so particular. reciprocal agreements are, are a reserved matter. Um, I understand that the UK government um, are, are attempting to get reciprocal agreements in place. Um, until recently, we've not been given terribly much information around that. 
Um, but I think we're starting to have a bit, a bit more information about the discussions they're having. Do you want to add a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, can I just sure. add that uh, the UK government has uh, entered into agreements with uh, Switzerland, uh, Liechtenstein, Norway, and uh, Denmark already. So there will be reciprocal agreements with those countries. Thank you very much, and, and um, it would be helpful to have that confirmed as and when uh, there's a formal. Uh, presumably, you, the, if, if, at the point at which formal arrangements are reached, that will be made public. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. On the legislation in front of us, can the Minister, can you indicate what guidance will be issued to NHS boards uh, and potentially to individuals uh, in relation to the operation of these, this instrument? Okay, so um, currently in terms of the, the implementation of the directive, we have the European Cross-Border Healthcare National Contact Point, and it's our intention to um, retain, retain that contact point. So that was established when um, the directive was transposed into domestic legislation back in 2013. Um, so our intention is to maintain that and to update that to include the provisions in the amendment regulations, which are unpunning um, these regulations in the guidance which will be issued to NHS boards, um, just to give a, a bit of elaboration about what that, that looks like. So it's a, it's a web facility maintained by NHS Inform and obviously the information arm of NHS 24 and it provides information for patients who wish to use a cross-border healthcare route for treatment overseas and it also contains contact details for cross-border leads within each of our NHS boards. So that, that would be maintained as is and updated, obviously. Okay, thank you very much. Emma Harper. Thank you, convener. Good morning to you. Um, I'm interested in the, I guess, the fact that, that there are patients that want to make a specific request to use the directive under Article 8, so patients have to make this specific request. Does the minister know how many Scottish residents are currently awaiting treatment under this directive in another member state? So, currently waiting. Um, so... I the, the figures in terms of um, patients would be collated um, on an annual basis um, and, and, and published in, in, in the April. So we'll get last year's figures will be published this um, April. Um, so the latest figures which are available, which would give you an indication of the sort of numbers that we have, um, would be from 2017, so published last April. Um, and in that year, there were um, 29 29 people, so relatively small numbers of folk, and I think we reckon the cost is around £50,000 was, was, was that cost. I think I, I've got a list here of um, the, the countries that each of those 29 people came from, but I think there would be a danger of me identifying the individuals because you're talking about two people from one country, five from another, one from another, one from another, one from another. There's one country where there were 16 people, so that one, one, one country, but mainly small, small numbers of people um, making that choice um, and that's the latest figures from from uh, 2017. And in April next month, sometime we should likely get the numbers for last year. Yes. What happens is we get a questionnaire every year from uh, the European Commission. <laughs> it comes into the UK government. We then go out to NHS boards, and they provide the information we need. So, just an, an additional question would be that so these are patients that are seeking um, uh, health care from who live in Scotland but might be going to Spain, for instance. Would this include patients that are seeking dialysis that are maybe wintering over in Spain? So, so that, that's a really good, good question, and um, that would not be covered by this. So currently, that would be covered by the EHIC card, I think, in the main. I mean, I think it could be covered by this, but um, that would be covered by the EHIC card. Um, and um, I, I, th I think what you're, where you're answering, asking is... Uh, a really important question, and I don't think there's a particularly good answer for people in, in, in that circumstance. Um, so this does not, the, these regulations don't replace the EHIC card. Um, recipro reciprocal arrangements could do that um, where, where we get them, so that would be depend on, on what kind of agreements we could get. Um, but I think, I think it's a, a really important point, and it's, I guess, um, well, whether Brexit Day is 29th March, 12th of April, or some other time into the future, whenever it is, it's important that people make sure they understand what the implications are for them individually. For most people travelling, it will be, I guess, about having in insurance that will cover them for um, all eventualities. But um, you're talking about a particular group of people with 
um, uh, um, medical conditions which might be difficult to get insurance for. So, do you want to add anything to that? Not really, just that uh, that would be something uh, in the short term if somebody was looking for uh, health care uh, for dialysis uh, when they were in sort of Europe for maybe two or three weeks, we might sort of ask an NHS <coughs> board to, tick, to pick up uh, the bill for that, you know, uh, under sort of basic equality sort of, you know, considerations, but uh, that would be down to individual boards whether they'd be prepared to fund that or not. So we need to make sure that people are really clear and understand what this reciprocal process w w w entails. Um, I have had I, a constituent myself who came from Cyprus who needed dialysis in Ayrshire, and it was really, really complicated to try and organise that. I, I think the point you're making is, um, you know, some of the details that I, I think when people voted a number of years ago for um, in, in the referendum, this sort of detail was never discussed, and so I, I think. What you're making is a really good case for why we need another people's vote. David Stewart. I think um, Emma Hart makes an extremely good point on this particular issue. Um, I personally would be surprised if the EHIC card covers dialysis abroad. I mean, obviously within Scotland, the, the Minister will have figures for the amount of EU nationals um, who receive dialysis under EHIC. I would be very surprised if there's any substantial numbers in that. Could, perhaps the Minister won't have that to hand, but perhaps could he ask health boards if they could provide us with some information? Because that, to me, seems... That so, seems to me to be beyond the terms of the of the. I don't think that information would be available, but uh, the EHIC card uh, covers pre-existing conditions, which includes dialysis. Sure, yep. sure. But I mean, the the idea that you know you break your leg in Spain and you go into a hospital and you get reciprocal health care is well understood. The idea that you go in without, and this is Emma Harper's point, you go into a hospital in Spain without any pre-authorization and ask for. Uh, kidney dialysis and an EHIC card, I would be very surprised if that's done on a regular basis without lots of prior um, authorisation. You would certainly want to make sure you're aware of, of what, what support you're going to get. There would definitely be safety aspects there, but uh, it does happen. But just on the reporting, Minister, I mean, health boards in Scotland that are providing care to um, EE uh, citizens under EHIC need to communicate that back to you in terms of the work that they've carried out. There is terms of, I mean, obviously, this is, we're not looking at the, well, these regulations. No, no, we're not. are not about EHIC. So I, 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 think we're, I didn't we're, raise EHIC. Uh, yeah. You did. <laughs> but, but that's not um, what these regulations I, are that, about. So. It was you that raised the point. That's yeah. why I'm just trying to confirm this. Do you have figures on that? Or can you ask your boards to give a return on how many patients have got? received treatment from EHIC. There can, is can, we we can we take that away and see what we can do on that one? OK. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, Minister, you mentioned in your opening remarks about uh, agreements uh, and consent in regards to England and Northern Ireland. Now, I have great concerns, having read the letter which was sent to the committee from uh, the Cab Sec on the 21st of March, in regards to the fact that uh, the Scottish Parliament and, obviously, the uh, ministers and this committee don't seem to have the consent or an agreement from uh, Westminster and to how the, as to how this is going to work. And if I could just um, give you a couple of quotes, when the uh, convener had asked some questions of the Cabinet Secretary, you know, basically why we don't have delegated powers in, in this consent. Uh, the Minister mentioned the fact that Wales and, and Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Government, place great importance uh, on the protection of its devolved status and legislative competence. And they had actually written to the equivalent uh, minister in um, Westminster. Uh, a perfectly reasonable request, uh, but uh, the last paragraph mentions the fact that the UK government has, however, rejected this reasonable demand and has little prospect of a reversal at this time, uh, which is obviously to do with legislation and this parliament being given due powers, delegated powers in regard to this. Do we have any follow-up from that, rather than a memorandum of understanding, or will this come back to the committee? Because it is very worrying that it's went through the House of Lords, Westminster, it is a devolved matter, and yet we are not given the legis legislative powers in this parliament to deal with it. So, and, and we're absolutely clear that we think that the powers of this parliament and powers of devolution should be respected at all times. Um, so, to say 
the Scottish Government is not happy about the, the current um, arrangements um, would be an understatement. Mm. Um, I, I think it's really important that when we're talking about devolved matters, the powers of this Parliament, so it's not about the Scottish Government, it's about this Parliament being given its mm. place, um, should be respected at all times. And, and um, so we were very disappointed that the proposals that, they, that, that came forward, which would have guaranteed um, the powers of devolution, were, were not accepted um, by the UK Government. Um, that said, we've, we've got to make a decision about what's in the interests of, of uh, the people of Scotland, and so that's why we're taking a pragmatic approach here with these orders, which is about protecting um, a, a small number of citizens who could find themselves in a difficult place if we didn't do this. Could I just have a small follow-up? Thank you. Uh, in that respect, uh, we understand we want to make it smooth, seamless, but we don't know even at this moment in time what's happening <laughs> uh, in regards to Brexit, whether it's going to come about or not. But can yourself as a minister uh, give this committee or the parliament uh, some form of guarantee that if they do not have this power, we do not, the Scottish Parliament has this power, exactly how we're going to protect these people? And would we write letters again or would we ask them to come uh, from Westminster to give uh, you know, evidence to this committee as why we're not getting the powers? Obviously, it's up to this, this committee to decide how, how you want to do your business. Um, you can be rest assured that the, the Scottish Government will continue to press the point to protect the powers of, of this Parliament. Um, but, you know, you're right, we, 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 there's a, a huge amount of uncertainty remains around um, the, the whole matter of Brexit. However, what's in, what we're discussing today is um, arrangements which would, come into, would only come into effect in the event of a no-deal Brexit. Um, so it's, it's that worst case scenario and, and making sure that, that we've, we've, we've got um, provisions in place for that scenario, whether it's the 29th of March, 12th of April or some other time that we get to that um, cliff edge, um, these are, are, that's when this would come into effect and it would come into effect before Brexit Day. Thanks very much. We'll certainly, as a committee, consider these matters going forward. One last question, in just in terms of some of the statistics you mentioned, the last numbers you had were... Um, uh, from 2017 on 29 people going one way. Do we know what the numbers are going the other way? So, not aware of any patients from other EEA uh, countries using the directive to access treatment in Scotland. Um, so, as, as far as we're aware, the directive has never been used in, in that way. Um, so, I'm <laughs> Thanks very much. David Stewart, I think I had one last supplementary. Yeah, one. I think you may have par partially covered that, uh, Computer. Can I just, Minister, ask you about transition agreement? And I think member, my colleagues probably raised as well the fact that the directive is very rarely used in Scotland. We're not talking about the S1 or S S2 routes. Uh, but the, the scenario, as you will know, is if um, a, a Scottish pensioner living in the uh, EEA countries, and just for the record, that would be the 28 um, uh, community countries plus Iceland, uh, Liechtenstein and Norway, just for completeness, plus Switzerland. Um, so if someone in that situation has had prior agreements to get treatment in Scotland, uh, as you know, there's a 12-month uh, period where they will be provided free of charge in Scotland. Um, do Have you got contingency to cope with that, Minister? I take it the numbers will not be high, uh, but if there's suddenly going to be a surge, health boards need to have capacity to do this. Could you tell us a little bit more about the transition arrangements? Um, so I'm, I'm not understanding how there would be a surge. So this is kind of maintaining a, a transition of what's there just now. So I don't see how it would ever get higher than is there just now, if you understand. Maybe, well, I'm, maybe I'm not understanding the question. So, so John, the position, John, well, the position, just to clarify, Minister, as you, you will be familiar with this, but uh, under the transition agreements, where um, a, a Scottish pensioner, just to give you an example, living pensioner, in sorry. one of the eligible countries, has had prior uh, arrangements uh, or prior permission to have treatment in Scotland. Uh, during the 12 months period after this goes ahead, there is an agreement that healthcare will be provided free by the Scottish Health Service. That's in the, Sorry, that's in the regulations. That's in, that's in the regulations. Yes. yes. So do you have any idea of the numbers that will be using this over the, that 12 month period? I, 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 don't, I don't think we do. We don't have numbers. Um, however, you know, the, the alternative would be to potentially leave um, some of these individuals with, with no, no access to healthcare anywhere in, in, in Europe. And, and so I, th I think it's pragmatic that we take, um, take that this is in, in the regulations. Um, no, the, reg the regulation says that if they've got agreement, they get free treatment in Scotland yeah. for a 12-month so, period. So That's laid down in the regulations we're approving well, today. Could I just add that uh, 
pensioners coming back to Scotland. We don't have numbers for them. We don't know how many there's going to be. So uh, we'll be monitoring the position, obviously. It's for a year. Uh, England has already done this, and Wales are considering doing it as well. So uh, to follow the sort of other countries uh, is probably sensible for Scotland to do it too. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I am sympathetic with the minister's comment that you know he's not, and the minister's not expecting a surge. But of course, if you don't know the numbers, you don't know if there's going to be a surge or not. All I'm getting at is um, we need to have give some uh, understanding to our health boards that there will be additional pressure on NHS resources in Scotland for a 12-month period because the rec because the. I'm not, oh, can I'm I just not, finish, yeah, Minister? Sorry. Right. If you, if you let me finish, maybe you'll understand the point I'm making. Uh, the issue is there is a 12-month transition laid down in the regulations we are agreeing today. It says if you've had prior agreement, you have a right to get health care in Scotland if you live in one of these countries I've just mentioned for 12 months. You're saying you do not know how many people will access this. Therefore, it's difficult to know if there will be a surge or not. My assumption is there will not be a lot of pensioners who are going to access this because the directive is not widely used across the EU. All I'm saying is, for good planning of our health service, surely you should try and find out the figures involved. I, I think your premise of it, it's not a huge number is, is, is probably correct, but I think that's a point that we'll, we'll take on and just Thank you. to check if there's information we can give. Thank you. Did Brian Whittle, did you want a brief? No, you're, I you're, do, yeah. actually. Uh, if, if I could, um, good morning to the panel. I've been listening with... with, uh, with Make your point. Can I mention that we move on shortly to the debate? So, if it's a point rather than a question, then I would suggest you leave it to the debate. Okay, I'll leave it to the debate. Okay, Convenor. thank you very much. That allows us to move on to agenda item number three, uh, which is the formal debate on the affirmative uh, SSI, which we have just heard evidence. Um, remind members that we now no longer put questions. We may make uh, uh, points in debate. Uh, and officials also will not take part at this stage. So uh, can I invite the Minister please to move the motion S5M16442. Formally moved. Thank you very much. Uh, I see Brian Whittle. Thank you, Kivira. I know I'll kick off. Uh, I think I've, I've, been listening to the, I've been listening to the, 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 the questions from the Minister with, with great interest. I'm going to declare an interest here that, that uh, my parents uh, lived in Spain for 10 years and both of them had uh, while they were out there, had uh, serious conditions that were treated both in Spain and in the UK, and there wasn't any problem. One was cancer, one had a back operation, and I'm, I think we are cr trying to create problems here out of this. The politi we're pol politicking, round, politicking, politicking round this table, and we're creating problems. The reality is, as it currently stands, you, if you, you can get treatment in a new country, and you can, if you come back here, you get treatment here as well. That that practically happened and there weren't any barriers to that. So I don't know where we're going with this particular, what we're trying to get out of this, but it, it's, it really is starting to irk me here that we're, we're trying to create problems that aren't there. Thank you very much. Any other contributions uh, to the debate? I see none. Minister, would you like just, to Just to wrap respond? up, I think um, Mr Whittle is absolutely correct about a system which works really well across Europe just now. Um, what these regulations are about is um, putting in place protections in the event of a no-deal Brexit. And if we don't put in, in, in place these protections, then there could be people who are um, currently in the process of going through um, the, the, using the directive to access treatment uh, in another, another EU, EU country who would potentially be left high and dry in the middle of that process, either just prior to receiving their operation or just after receiving the operation prior to receiving funding. So I know we've, we've talked about a number of matters around the table, and I understand the committee likes to do that, which don't relate directly to these um, the, 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 what the regulations that are before us. But the regulations b before us are a pragmatic approach to deal with um, a, a no-deal Brexit. And in, the, in any, uh, any other scenario, they wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily be required. So. Okay. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, the question is that the motion S5M16442 be agreed. Are we all agreed? agreed. That is agreed. Thank you very much, Minister. We'll adjourn for a few moments to um, allow the Minister to depart.
always check the technology before you begin. Um, we will resume the meeting and um, resume at item four in the agenda, which is consideration of a negative instrument, the National Health Service Superannuation and Pension Schemes Scotland Miscellaneous Amendments Regulation 2019. Colleagues will recall that we considered this instrument at last week's meeting and agreed to write to the Scottish Government for further information on a number of issues. We have now received a letter uh, this morning from Kate Forbes, the uh, Minister for F uh, Public Finance and Digital Economy, um, in response to the questions we asked. Uh, can I invite uh, comments from members? David Stewart. <coughs> Thank you, Convener. You recall that I raised this uh, last week. Uh, my concern about this is the jump in the employer contribution uh, by 6% next month. And many members uh, will have received correspondence from uh, GPs, particularly. Uh, this will affect them dramatically, for example, in the costs of their own staff, like receptionists. Uh, now, this may end up with redundancies in the longer term. It may uh, also affect some GP practices who cannot continue and go back uh, to health boards, which obviously is a worry. There's particular issues in rural areas. I think it will affect retention and recruitment um, of GPs. I also think there'll be an issue in non-NHS employees like uh, hospice movement, and Charles wrote to us uh, recently, a number of members have also raised this. Charles mentioned it will cost another 350,000 a year, which is nine uh, full-time nurses. So I've seen the letter from the Minister. Obviously, these are primarily reserved issues, uh, but on top of, of the lifetime allowances and the annual allowance, these issues are hitting GPs and consultants in particular. They are all reserved. I don't think we can do anything but accept the instrument today. However, I do think it's important to put on the record uh, my great concern, I'm sure, shared by the, the committee, the effect that this will have unless there's a Barnet consequential uh, to try and remedy what's going to happen to GPs particularly. So it's just to put on the record the concerns about retention and recruitment of GPs in particular. Indeed. I think very important points. Sandra White. Thank you very much, Convener. Yeah, I have also have concerns in, in regards to this and, and had raised it earlier also. Uh, Dave Stewart's correct about not just the GPs, it affects receptionists, etc., etc., but it can also affect charities too. Uh, and that's when I have great concern. I know it was raised at the Health Committee as well in this Parliament in regards to how it could affect, uh, sorry, the Education Committee, how it could affect that. And when I checked with SPICE in regards to this, SPICE weren't aware of it either, uh, which was last week. So it's something that's coming through that a lot of people aren't aware of, but it can have really dire consequences on, on the services. And the big worry is if the Westminster government, uh, because it is reserve matter, uh, does not um, give in monies either consequentials, and I don't think it actually fits into the part of consequentials in health because it's not just health that's affected as other areas as well. But I would like that clarified, if at all possible, in that respect. But it really could have dire effects in frontline services in the Health Committee and also uh, throughout. So whilst I understand and I have spoken and, and asked advice that we cannot stop this from going through today, uh, I wonder if the committee would be minded to you know, follow through on some of the concerns that myself and others have raised in regards to this, and perhaps write to uh, the Minister again, Kate Forbes, for clarification on where the money actually is going to come from or whether the Scottish Government is going to press the UK Government for these extra funds. It's them that have raised this pension funding, and uh, therefore it shouldn't be incumbent on us, the Scottish Parliament, who doesn't have that power to make up the shortfall. And it's a worrying trend. If this is a trend, this is just one of many that's coming forward. Thank you very much. Uh, Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener. Um, I just want to raise my concerns also, and I agree with Dave Stewart and Sandra White about uh, different aspects of people working in GP practices, whether they're doctors, nurses, receptionists, or um, and the admin staff as well. But uh, I represent a rural region, and uh, we already have recruitment challenges for our GPs, so I want to make sure that we continue to monitor this and make sure that uh, there isn't a negative impact from these changes. I, I think that's absolutely right. I think it's important to say a couple of things. First of all, to Sandra White, it is open to us to stop this instrument today, but clearly if we do so, that is to annul uh, the instrument and therefore it would go to the Chamber this week because it is due to come into force on the 1st of April. So um, it would be, it would have to be dealt with by the Parliament 
uh, in time for it to be. So that option is available to us. In terms of the question around funding, I think it's worth uh, uh, simply reminding colleagues that uh, Kate Forbes is very clear in her letter. Failure to fully fund these costs will have a significant and detrimental effect on the delivery of essential frontline services in Scotland. Uh, clearly, the government is continuing to engage with the Treasury on that issue, uh, but it is important to, to note that. Uh, she also says, the Minister also says, that the Scottish Government will take the appropriate steps to disperse additional funding if that is received from the Treasury. Uh, and she also says, if there is a shortfall in the funding from the UK Government, the Scottish Government will consider how this shortfall will be met. Um, now, that seems to me to imply that the shortfall will be met, uh, but I think it would be worth uh, our while, uh, even if we agree to approve this instrument, it would be worth our while to uh, write back to Kate Forbes and ask for confirmation uh, that that is the intention, that come what may, uh, the shortfall will be met and there will not be the impact on GP practices, hospices and, and others that, that members have raised. Are members so minded? Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, is the committee therefore agreed to make no recommendations on this instrument? Yeah. That is agreed. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we now move on to agenda item number five, uh, uh, an evidence session with NHS Lanarkshire, part of a series of evidence sessions which the committee is holding with territorial health boards. Let me therefore welcome to the committee Nina Mahal, the chair, uh, Callum Campbell, uh, chief executive of NHS Lanarkshire, uh, Dr Lin Linda Finlay, Medical Director, South Lanarkshire Health and Social Care Partnership, and Ross McGuffey, uh, Interim Chief Officer of North Lanarkshire Health and Social Care Partnership, uh, Dr Jane Burns, Medical Director, NHS Lanarkshire, and Heather Knox, the Deputy Chief Executive and Director of Acute Services. Uh, can I welcome you all to the committee and thank you for uh, the evidence you have submitted in advance of our consideration today. Um, clearly, one of the first areas of consideration for the committee and scrutiny of boards is uh, the fundamental issue of financial balance and being able to achieve uh, your many objectives within the envelope that's available to you. Um, and we noted in, in looking at your financial plan and also at uh, the annual audit by, uh, by Audit Scotland uh, that there was an, that it was anticipated that you would be facing a £26 million funding gap uh, for the current year, uh, the year nearly finished, um, but that you have now uh, achieved something, uh, well, break even with some on some recurrent uh, efficiencies required. Be useful to have a, a brief summary of that and also an explanation, given that the, the, the funding gap was significant only a few months ago, an explanation of what you've done in order to uh, close that gap. Thank you very much. Uh, firstly, can I just say a, a thank you to the committee for giving us the opportunity to present evidence to you today. Um, in relation to financial balance, um, I will ask the Chief Executive to give more specific details, but you are correct in saying that we are uh, aiming to achieve financial balance at the end of this year, and we have done for a number of years. Um, it has been very challenging, and I think we can talk about some of the challenges as we go forward. But as to the reasons why we have perhaps been able to do that, I believe that in the board we do have very tight management of our financial situation. We have good oversight and scrutiny from the board right down to individual teams. Uh, the finance team is very well known throughout the organisation. We have also um, a very joined up approach where we engage with our clinicians and our staff through the Area Partnership Forum and the Area Clinical Forum when we discuss our savings. We have a very structured approach to how we consider savings. Uh, we do quite a lot of horizon scanning at the board. Uh, we're able to identify risks quite clearly and early on, but we do have to obviously have that balance between finance, performance and not compromising on quality. So I think the approach we've taken in Lanarkshire has been helpful in ensuring that it's forefront in everybody's minds, but without compromising on ensuring that we also maintain performance and quality. In terms of the specifics, I'll turn to, to our Chief Executive, who can maybe talk a little bit more about some of the challenges that we have going forward. Thank you. I think the, the Chair touched on it. I think the first thing I would say is we have a particular approach in Lanarkshire. 
I can't speak for other boards, but certainly we've got a very gifted director of finance and finance team. And what we do is we take a risk-based approach. So those schemes come forward. We actually risk assess every scheme. So we don't automatically presume that it's going to be 100% successful. And we work through that with general managers and clinicians. I think the second thing is, one of the things we do is we challenge any cost pressures. We don't just accept that a cost pressure is the automatic solution is we have to then fund that cost pressure. And if I give you a practical example of that, we had challenges in our mortuary. Uh, the good case come forward with, uh, we are getting larger as a, as a nation, so therefore we require some bariatric additional capacity in our mortuary. The estates team pulled together, it was a very good business case. It came to a quarter of a million pound. If it came across your desk, you would think it was well thought through and logical. But because we work as a team, the head of procurement actually looked, and you can actually buy bespoke units for mortuaries for the larger individual. And in effect, that quarter of a million pound cost pressure actually became a 70,000 pound cost pressure. So it's to try and look for innovative solutions. I would also touch on prescribing. The reality is in the past, we've maybe not been the, the best around prescribing. We've had a prescribing quality efficiency programme. I'm sure it will come up later on in the discussion. We were the second highest per head of weighted population in Scotland. We're now below average in that sense. And that's using prescribing quality efficiency. It's not just cost savings, it's the emphasis has been on quality. So to get that 26 million down, we have made savings in prescribing. We've made savings in procurement. We've reduced our agency and drug expenditure. But the reality is there's over 100 other schemes we've had to work through to achieve that. And we will go into next year with some non-recurring pressures still requiring to be found. Thank, thank you. Th th thank you very much. Um, the clearly... As a well-run ship in, in financial management terms, you will be looking at uh, announcements by the Scottish Government providing brokerage to other boards, writing off brokerage, uh, and other boards saying they may need future brokerage. What incentive do you have as a board to maintain that uh, prudent and, and, and proactive approach to uh, financial management? So I think if, if I could maybe start off, I think it's extremely important that we recognise that this is about providing safe care for our patients, so that has to be at the forefront of everybody's minds. But yes, it is challenging, given that we're a board that has not um, had brokerage or a bailout, and I think in terms of keeping our staff incentivised, it will be quite challenging going forward. And as I said, I think it, you know, it will be helpful if um, the Chief Executive can explain what some of those challenges will be going forward. But we will endeavour to keep that tight ship, as you've indicated. And I think the key thing for us is we work very much as a team, from the board right down to individuals. We, we absolutely are clear about our direction of travel, we have a strategic direction in terms of a healthcare strategy, working very closely with the IGBs. We know where we want to go, we know what we want to deliver, but it is going to be very challenging given that we are not, um, to use the word rewarded, being rewarded for the performance that we are delivering. Callum Campbell. Thank you. I think with any allocation formula, there can be opportunities to improve it, but it's important you have an allocation formula. Just to set the context slightly, to be clear, around Lanarkshire, we are one of the lowest GMS funded per head of population boards in Scotland. We've got two PFIs because there wasn't capital available at the time when two of our hospitals were to be built, and that comes at a pressure of about £60 million a year. Uh, we do have good corporate buy-in because at the end of the day, the board wants to stay in control without external influences as to how we go about things. But the important point, and I think your question is very, very fair, there needs to be fairness, there needs to be equity, because the board is fundamentally there to do the best it can for the population it serves. And the people of Lanarkshire are, in many areas, a deprived population. We need to make sure we get a fair allocation for them. Can I maybe put my question as, oh, not quite the other way around, but from a different perspective? If it is the case that dealing with a large and, and, as you say, in many cases, relatively disadvantaged population, you are able to deliver services within the financial constraints you have. And you see 
other boards are not able to do that. Is there a mechanism by which you seek to share your approach to financial management with other boards across NHS Scotland? Yeah, certainly. The, if I focus on my Director of Finance, my Director of Finance frequently meets all the other Directors of Finance in NHS Scotland, and certainly the West of Scotland Directors of Finance. Equally, myself and my executive colleagues have similar meetings. And one of my favourite sayings is, I've never had an innovative idea in my life, but I specialise in plagiarism. We spend a lot of time looking at what others have done, and there is no shame. It's the highest compliment to steal shamelessly what others have done to be successful. And a good example of that, we were one of the last boards to implement script switch, which is one of the re mechanisms through which we've made prescribing savings, but it has delivered for us. So we do try and share with boards and we equally learn from boards. The increasing cost of medicines is one of the challenges that I think all boards face. Is, is it your view that script switch has enabled you to uh, D address that directly, and will it be adequate going forward to keep those costs under control? So, so I'll, I'll maybe start and maybe ask my medical director to say a few words. I think one of the biggest cost pressures we are going to face going forward will be the cost of acute drugs. The reality is we'll get about a 2.6% uplift this year, but our acute drug expenditure will increase by around 16%. And over the last five years, we've seen that expenditure grow by around about 60%. This is a massive pressure that, to be honest, if we don't do something about it, we won't be able to sustain balance going forward. I don't know if the medical director wants to elaborate. Jane Burns. Yes, I, I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Um, so, uh, uh, as Mr Campbell has said, um, I think one of the key um, responses to this across the whole organisation is a, a relentless focus on the quality of care that we provide. Uh, and with that focus, we have clinical engagement and support um, for driving uh, those all uh, initiatives forward. And as you know, um, safe care costs less um, because we don't have the same complications in patient care to deal with. Uh, so that's what motivates our clinical teams and that will produce a sustainable uh, uh, methodology for us moving forward. However, there are some real, uh, really significant outstanding challenges for us. In the past 12 months, we have had a quality approach to reducing variation uh, and standardising our approach to antimicrobial prescribing in line with best practice stewardship. As examples, we've reviewed high-risk areas of prescribing um, and, and, as been said, we've had a reduction in costs per patient uh, below the national average when we look at the weighted cost per individual patient, uh, and, and that's now uh, amongst best in class. The change in switch script gives us the opportunity with primary care prescribing to continue to um, offset the rises in primary care prescribing that we are predicting for the forthcoming year. However, the significant challenges are within the acute division. The acute division uh, in, um, in the year 18 to 19, just ending, um, uh, is predicted to come in with a marginal overspend of, of something just under 1% um, of the 51.23 million budget. Um, and that's despite a 6% increase in costs that's largely due to increases in the treatments for lung cancer, myeloma and prostate cancer. Uh, we've managed that by um, a, a, a significant number of initiatives. So we've switched um, by similar agents in a, with a quality approach, using nurse practitioners uh, to support um, not just the, the change from one uh, agent to another, more cost-effective agent, but also looking at reducing and, in some cases, stopping a patient's medication where they've been on uh, that treatment for a long time. Uh, we've managed to recruit some patients on some very high-cost medicines, into research studies, and that offsets the cost uh, to the NHS of paying for the, those high-cost medicines. We've increased the number of patients who are being managed by healthcare at home, where the medicine is delivered to the patient's home, and that's produced an in-year saving of £2 million. And in addition to that, we've had a range of initiatives across our acute hospital sites, again, with reduction in variation, looking at things like patients bringing in their own medication rather than reproviding um, extra uh, extra 
dispensed medicines, looking at the consistency of clinical practice, switching from intravenous medicines to oral medicines, which also has the benefit of reducing uh, healthcare-associated infection, and also a, a, a real rigour by our hospital pharma pharmacists looking at the costs of individual medicines as they can fluctuate throughout the year, uh, depending on the supplier. However, looking forward to next year, as our Chief Executive has said, we are looking at a 16.6 per cent increase in our acute drugs costs. 54 per cent of that is expected to be in new cancer drugs that have already been approved by the Scottish Medicines Consortium. But a, a concerning area for us is that about 22 per cent of that is medicines that are going through the new Pax2 process. Uh, and my concern around uh, that process is for the, for the drugs that are authorised to go through that process, but also those where we have been advised that we should put some medicines through that process, despite them not having approval from the Scottish Medicines Consortium, is that it's a much more permissive way of, of prescribing. Um, we would previously have a senior clinical professional input in a, a, a broader based panel to the decision making around very high cost medicines to support the clinicians making the recommendations to ensure that they are not um, deferring to undue bias towards the individual patient that they are treating personally um, because it is often very difficult to tell a patient that you no longer have something new to offer that is going to be beneficial towards them. Um, so that governance process, I would liken to the, the sort of governance process that used in multidisciplinary team uh, meetings, where if, if a patient was, was, was scheduled to have cancer surgery, for example, that would be a team-based decision to discuss the potentially effective uh, treatments available for a patient. And then the patient would be given an opportunity to discuss that with their treating clinicians on a shared decision-making basis. And the process that we've now got in place for medicines management bypasses that governance and that team-based approach, and that's going to give us a significant cost pressure in the coming year. Thanks very much. Brief supplementary from Brian Whittle, and then we'll you move on to Dave Stewart's question. touched on an area that interests me greatly, um, around, uh, especially around treatments and prescri prescribing of medicines and this increase in prescription of, uh, prescribing of medicines. I just wonder where, within, within the budget that you have, um, everybody would agree that prevention is better than cure. Um, and that we're, we're trying to move towards that preventative health agenda. Within the budget that you have, are you able to start to work towards that sort of early intervention that would maybe maybe uh, help to cut uh, the, the sort of treatment and prescription costs that you're currently talking about? There are absolutely additional measures that we will be rolling out um, as new initiatives, but also as extended initiatives. One of the areas that we've really just uh, started to develop a process for is po addressing polypharmacy. So addressing the number of patients who are on a large number of medicines, who've often been on them for a long number of years, and they cease to have any particular benefit, and in fact, may be contributing to harm because of the potential interactions, uh, or because over, over time, over a decade perhaps, of taking a medicine, the benefit that existed 10 years ago is no longer of the same magnitude to the patient. Uh, so, so we're starting to get into looking at how we can, we can manage that agenda in particular. David Stewart. Thank you, if I could just as a very quick point on that before I go on to my substantial question. Um, a number of colleagues here are very interested in diabetes. Uh, Brian Whittle and Emma Harper myself all chaired the cross-party group on diabetes. Um, I, I am very enthusiastic about preventative spend. As you know, around 10% of spend is because of diabetes complications. On technology, I've been very impressed with uh, some of the continuous glucose monitoring devices like Freestyle Libra and I visited yesterday Dexcom, who've got the new G6, which is absolutely state-of-the-art uh, facility. I don't have shares in this company, I hasten to add. Um, the reason I was raising this is we know that these devices uh, can save money. We know that there's a complicated route through not the medicines, but the technology approvals. And um, some boards, including in my neck of the woods up north, were a bit slow before the final approval. So the point I'm making is sometimes you've got to spend to save money. And certainly in diabetes, this is vitally important. And some countries 
uh, like Sweden, 85% uh, of uh, type 1s are actually on a form of uh, continuous glucose monitoring, which is phenomenal. So the general point is um, you can save money by investing in technology. Uh, these devices are very effective. Uh, what can you do in your own board to promote not just pumps, which are very effective, but the stage before that really is the uh, continuous glucose monitoring devices? So I completely agree. The preventative agenda in diabetes uh, care is, is absolutely essential. Um, it, 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 it is an area that is well worthy of uh, an invest-to-save approach um, because the population benefits it might be 10 or 20 years down the line, um, but the reduction in the complications, the longer-term complications for diabetes, one of the, the, the main healthcare challenges that we're facing. Um, our diabetes team work through a managed clinical network um, and they support patients to move on to different types of glucose monitoring as appropriate to their care as and when they require it, and they do that in an evidence-based way. Uh, but sometimes the greatest barriers are um, they, it, being able to bring the patients in to actually give them the education to use the technology effectively. Thanks, I got arrived from the convener, if I don't move on. It's just to say, what worked in the past is targets for pumps. As you know, there were real problems before that. Um, my, my own theory from a meeting I had yesterday with uh, Dexcom was that what I think will probably work is a target for continuous glucose monitoring, because that's what bo boards respond to, because you're getting the chief exec's letters and so on. It's not one I would expect a, a political answer on today, but is that something maybe your board can have a think about, whether that would work or not? Again, we're keen to look at all measures that, that, that will improve the health of the population. Um, so it would be inappropriate to make a comment, but it is some, obviously something that we would go away and consider. I think we do also have to look at some of the upstream work we can do around health uh, preventative measures to stop people from getting diabetes in the first place. So it's the early interventions when somebody has diabetes, but I think we also need to see what else can we do, because th that is all about investment as well, and what benefits those investments at that very early stage to stop diabetes can, can also bring. Thank you very much. I, I better move on to my real questions, which were around uh, staffing and sickness. Um, could, could you explain the reasons for the long-standing high sickness absence rates? I think it's a number uh, warning was given in the uh, government stats on this particular issue. Okay. So our uh, sickness absence rate is roughly 6% um, against the, the government target. Um, again, we have a number of initiatives in place that are um, aimed at trying to improve that sickness absence rate. Again, very close management in terms of supporting people to come back to work where they can. But in terms of the specific initiatives and some of the things around the long-term sickness figures, I'll ask our Chief Executive to comment. Yeah, you're correct. We have been challenged with our sickness absence. One of the jobs I do as well as being Chief Exec of NHS Lanarkshire is I help co-chair Stack, and you'll be aware of part of the pay settlement this year has been the revised sickness absence approach, the Win for Scotland approach with key triggers within that. For the benefit of the official oh. report. So, sorry, Stack is the Scottish Terms and Conditions group where I'm the employer a representative on it and we have staff side colleagues there so part of the pay settlement for the NHS Scotland this year has been the fact there's various work streams one of them was on sickness absence so there is a revised once for Scotland policy it's going to come forward with key triggers in that to make sure we standardize it and try and drive that figure down we do try and use our occupational health service as best we can but as a concern for us that it is as high as that at present because, uh, as you know, and, uh, members will have had different life experiences where we're involved ourselves in recruitment. And, and certainly as a, a general stat, I would always look at companies and look at, I'll look at turnover, I would look at sickness absence, I would look at retention problems, um, because sometimes they're a sign of a deeper, a deeper problem. Um, you've, you've got some vacancy issues as well, particularly in medical and nursing roles. Would you like to say a little bit more about that and what you're doing to tackle these? If I could maybe ask our medical director to talk about the, specifically the medical vacancies that we have. Okay, thank you. Um, so our, our, our medical workforce um, is, is a stretched across primary care and secondary care. Um, I, I won't touch in detail on um, a primary care uh, 
medical staffing is the, the I'm sure Dr Finlay could uh, if required talk in detail around um, that workforce uh, but suffice to say we um, like most boards are facing some real challenges in recruitment and retention of general practitioners and we have a sustainability plan that we are working through with with our, our colleagues in the partnerships in relation to that and we are taking every endeavour to try and improve recruitment and retention um, we relatively recently had a meeting with NHS Education Scotland to try and increase the number of training placements in general practice and also to increase the number of training practices and the number of, uh, of authorised trainers that we have to try uh, and boost those numbers because we know that our workforce generally comes uh, in a sustainable way from those who live locally who want to continue to stay locally and, and, and the, the General Medical Council has good evidence around about that being a significant factor in career choices uh, for for young doctors in training. Within secondary care, we've had a large number of initiatives. Um, we um, have currently have a shortfall in our workforce of around 15 to 16 per cent, which is significantly above um, the, the national average. So we have that, that, that varies by specialty, and I can give you details of that if, if you wish to. But the general actions that we've taken to address have been whole system. So we have looked at how we can widen access to medical training. Um, uh, we've had developed relationships with the local schools. Uh, we run careers information services for uh, the local school pupils to come and learn about not just medical careers, but all careers in uh, the healthcare uh, uh, professions. Um, we look to uh, provide um, work experience for school pupils and specific work experience for higher school pupils who wish to enter uh, the medical profession, giving them some tailored experience and support with application for medical school. At undergraduate level, we have improved the level of training and the quality of training that we offer for uh, medical students coming out to our, our hospitals and our, our GP practices, because again, a, a positive experience as a medical student is likely to boost recruitment and retention there after. Um, so we've had some significant plaudits nationally across many of our specialties for under, the quality of undergraduate training. Um, we've also developed leadership roles within um, doctors and training and postgraduate training and um, sub substantially improved the quality of training for, I think, every single specialty that we have within NHS Lanarkshire. And again, we've had a significant number of plaudits and we were voted, uh, um, the I think Wishaw, University Hospital Wishaw was voted um, the best hospital to go and train in in a uh, re uh, recent poll uh, of local graduates. Uh, we focus on international recruitment as well through the colleges uh, for doctors and training. We also use that route for recruitment of consultants in very hard pressed specialties, particularly radiology and in mental health. Um, we look at development for consultants um, to, a, a, to a expand their portfolio into research and development, medical leadership and service redesign to make roles more attractive. So we, we, we think we've looked at the whole system uh, of uh, the, the things that will improve our ability to recruit and retain, but it remains very challenging as a board that sits between the two large university boards, uh, a, a medical school university boards, despite our strategic partnerships with other universities, um, to compete with larger teams uh, where out-of-hours work is less frequent. Yeah, yeah well, that, that just finally, because I know other colleagues want to come in, um, that all seems very sensible. Um, can you say a little, little bit about your strategy for attracting uh, non-EU staff? Because clearly, if we're looking towards, none of us can read the entrails of what's happening in Westminster, but on the basis that we are leaving. Um, presumably focusing on non-EU medical staff in particular would be important. And you may not have the figures in front of you, but could you also say something about the NHS surcharge? As you know, um, that was doubled by the UK government, uh, which is a, a cost that employers have to pay for non-EU staff, over over 30,000 normally. Um, you won't have that in front of you, I'm sure, but perhaps you could say a little bit about your strategy for non-EU, for example, India, Pakistan and so on. Yes, thank you. So the, so the international medical graduate route, there's, there's, there's two uh, different mechanisms that when we utilise both of them. One is the Scottish Government-sponsored uh, International Medical Training Fellowship. 
um, and these are posts which are for doctors towards the end of their formal training, so just short of consultant level. Um, and um, we have accessed that route to try and advertise for positions in emergency medicine and general medicine. So those are, are, are two hard-pressed areas for us. We haven't had tremendous success in those areas, I have to say, um, because the expectations of people coming to work at that level in their training uh, is that they will have a different experience from the one that we have to offer in terms of the service gap, which is not at, quite at that level. Uh, we have had more success with the college, the Royal College sponsored international uh, medical training initiative. Um, and that's something that many of our uh, consultants uh, came through themselves on, or have strong links with. So we have a, a, a number of doctors who are uh, graduates from India or Pakistan or who have family roots there. Uh, and um, they have used their contacts uh, to uh, identify individuals who can be sponsored through the Royal Colleges to come and work with us as international medical graduates. And that's usually the middle grade level of doctor, uh, which is exactly the area um, that where we have a, a service gap, but we also have strength and training as well. Thank you Thank very much. Uh, a number of colleagues have uh, supplemented questions in this area, um, and start with George Adam. Uh, thank you, convener. Good morning. Uh, Dr. Burns mentioned there one of the particular challenges you have with recruitment of staff being the fact you're in between Glasgow and Edinburgh. Uh, can we maybe elaborate on that? What particular challenges do you have in recruitment of staff, uh, that included obviously, and uh, also retention of staff? So I think that, I think again, if I could just comment, um, I think obviously we have these the medical schools in in Glasgow and Edinburgh, which um, you know Dr Burns can can refer to, but we are taking a number of initiatives to try and make sure that we are an employer of choice, and that we can also attract. Um, um, people to come and work with us, even though we don't have a medical school, school situated within Lanarkshire. So we are working very closely in partnership with a number of higher education institutions to look at innovative ways of attracting people. Because as um, Dr Burns was saying, once you've come and worked in Lanarkshire and you've trained in Lanarkshire, you are more likely to come back there um, for a permanent role. So it's about getting Lanarkshire, if I can call it, into the psyche of people, that it's a good place to work. Uh, and as I said, we have a number of initiatives around higher education institutions and at a very earlier level with school leavers who can then see what Lanarkshire is like and contemplate that as a place of, of working. But in terms of specific issues in having those medical schools, I think, again, Dr Burns might want to elaborate. Uh, thank you. So. Uh, uh, number of different areas. Um, th the first one is geography doesn't tend to be a huge issue um, because at consultant level most people are happy to travel across the central belt. Um, so so we, we can manage to recruit um, but we do sometimes have difficulty in retention um, and that it is usually because of the preferential um, work-life balance, I think I would describe it as, with a reduced frequency of out-of-hours work in the larger um, teaching hospitals that provide the tertiary services. Um, but also the fact that tertiary services are offered there, um, the um, more senior doctors in training have to go through rotations in those clinical departments in order to get all of the components that are required of the curriculum set by the General Medical Council for their, their full training. Um, if they miss those opportunities, they would have to go back and do them again. The, that cohort of doctors do rotate out for part of their training to Lanarkshire. However, those posts are general posts, general medicine, general surgery. Um, and th there is less requirement for those posts to be absolutely filled by the trainees. So there's no imperative for the trainee to have to come back and repeat a training allocation in a district general hospital if that's missed, because they usually by the time they get to the end of the training, they can, they can manage to achieve all of those competencies. So that slot in the duration of a seven-year training programme is often the one 
where a doctor in training will choose to take time out of programme, as it's described. It might be a time when doctors in training choose to start a, or complete a family, and, and that's so there's maternity and paternity leave are, are, are uh, things that impact our um, ability to show those doctors in training the benefits of working in Lanarkshire, is how I, I would describe it. So that is a, that's a real difficulty for us and, uh, and an area where we have a constant debate with NHS Education Scotland to say we have to have those posts filled so that we can compete in terms of recruitment and, re and retention of our staff and give those individual doctors the experience of working in Lancashire so that they will come and work with us. So that, that's something that we try to tackle. We've also created uh, different opportunities uh, for doctors in training who, at the completion of their foundation years, don't want to go straight into that lengthy seven-year training programme. I think the, the, the latest General Medical Council figures were that something like um, only 20% of doctors went straight on to those training programmes. So we've offered different opportunities that allow those uh, doctors in the third year of their training to go into medical education, uh, simulation training, um, leadership roles, quality improvement roles, etc., and give them a different opportunity that helps them to stay in Scotland. Uh, I'd like to ask about a specific issue. I'll probably declare an interest in the fact that I'm cross part, the convener for the cross party group in multiple sclerosis, and my wife is MS. And uh, there was a campaign about, about a year ago, two years ago, it started, where you had no MS nurses in North Lanarkshire, uh, sorry, Lanarkshire uh, NHS. And uh, one of the problems was that the previous nurse, and it's connected to this as well, the previous nurse had left because she believed she was overworked, uh, because she was dealing with more than the recommended 315 patients per individual with MS. So uh, now I believe you do have the 2.5, uh, or the cover for 2.5 MS nurses available now, which is a successful campaign, if you ask me. Uh, but at the uh, end of the day, the question is for the future. I know they're doing a review at the moment for services for those with MS in Lanarkshire. Where are we going for the future? What are we doing in Lanarkshire for those with MS and the nursing uh, in uh, Lanarkshire? And how are we making sure that something like what happened previously doesn't happen again? I'm happy to pick that, that up as best I can on behalf of my, my, my nursing colleagues. I think the future for services to, to support patients with MS lies in those nurse practitioners and, and providing um, services within the community, but also as a liaison service um, for um, p between patients and the consultant neurologists. Neurology is a very good example of a tertiary level service that is actually provided by NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. And although we have created um, Lanarkshire based consultant neurologist posts, we have failed to retain those individual consultants because they are more attracted to the tertiary centres where there's a high level of research in that particular area of specialism. We will never be able to numerically compete with that uh, because the numbers of consultant neurologists that we will ever have it will, will, will be... It, twos and threes at, at most. So that's quite a, that's quite difficult to sustain that workforce. So it becomes really important that other healthcare professionals such as uh, advanced nurse practitioners help support the service. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much. I remind colleagues, time marches on. And so uh, uh, brief questions and answers if we can. I'll call Hamilton. Vina, good morning to the panel. I'll try to be brief. Um, one of the things we have detected in our scrutiny of other boards and indeed other wings of the NHS um, is that when uh, recruitment and retention are an issue, that uh, obviously there's a corollary to staff morale and uh, the feelings that staff have of being heard, the faith they have in the systems that they can raise concerns through. Could you take us through your whistleblowing practices and your uh, the strata that you have within the health board to allow staff not just to um, complain or to raise concerns but also to contribute their own sort of ideas and expertise uh, to the growth and development of the organisation. So if I maybe start off and then I can turn to 
to other colleagues to contribute. So from a board's perspective, I think it's extremely important that we are connected to frontline staff and hear very much from the front line uh, what the issues are, what some of the challenges are, but also what some of the good things are that need to be celebrated. So all board members, for example, participate in leadership patient safety walk rounds. Uh, where we have an opportunity to go out and have quite a focus with staff to help understand from them what concerns they have. In addition, we obviously have the full um, whistleblowing policy uh, and practice, uh, which uh, again, our chief executive can talk through. We've also done quite a piece of work around psychological safety and uh, a sort of culture, safety culture survey around uh, cohorts of staff, starting with our nursing, midwifery, allied health professionals, but also expanding to other areas, which gives staff the opportunity to give their concerns, to voice their concerns in that safe space, to tell us how they feel um, about being able to raise concerns, either formally or informally, and what we can do about shaping that culture. I believe that that's what's really important. You can have all the policies and practices you want, but you have to have that open culture, a dialogue, and the ability to go out and reach out to staff in various ways. But maybe um, Mr Campbell might want to expand on some of those initiatives. Yeah. Just very, very briefly, I think the chair touched on one of the key differences. We do the psychological safety questionnaires, and that was started off in the nursing staff. It's now progressed beyond that, where we actually ask people whether they feel confident and safe enough to, to speak out, and especially if there's missed episodes of care. We want to be told that. The Chair touched on the fact that we do leadership walk-arounds. We also do patient safety walk-arounds, where you're walking around the place and it gives a chance people, A, to get to see you, B, uh, raise issues. And the other point I would make is we do have an email link if people want to email in anonymously to the Director of HR to raise issues. Again, that mechanism is in place. Much. Emma Harper. Thank you, convener. Good morning to everybody. Um, I'm interested in looking at uh, uh, waiting times, improving waiting times. I note that the the quarter two report was uh, submitted to the board, and it shows 11 key performance indicators with either red or amber. 12-week outpatient appointments, 18-week referral to treatment, CAMS, access to psychological therapies, advanced booking to primary care, detect cancer early, and others. So, as I said to convener, I'll try and keep this brief. I'm just, uh, I'm aware that money has been released from the Scottish Government, £146 million, to help address waiting times. So, I'd like to hear if you've heard how much NHS Lanarkshire is getting, and uh, then what do you propose to do with that? Thank you very much for that. Um, so if I can maybe split the contributions in response to your question in, in two bits. If I can get Mrs Knox to talk about the waiting times within the acute sector and Mr McGuffey can focus on the CAMS performance. Okay, thank you for the question. I think when it comes to performance, we do have areas where we have very good performance. So we're very proud of our cancer performance in particular and that's something we really focus on within the acute team. And we've also made great progress in our HSMR, our Hospital Standardised Mortality um, performance. And Jane can tell you more about that if you wish. And then there are areas, as you rightly point out, where we're working hard to put in place improvements within our performance. So if we look at Lanarkshire's performance against the outpatient 12-week target, which is one of the targets you mentioned, I'm really pleased to report that we've seen a significant improvement in that performance over recent months. Back in October, we had about 5,500 people waiting more than 12 weeks for an outpatient clinic attendance. Um, as of yesterday, we've managed to bring that down under 3,000, so I hope you'll agree that's quite a big improvement in quite a short period of time. And for the treatment time guarantee patients, i.e. patients waiting for an operation, the comparative figures back in October were over 2,000, they're now 1,430. So the, for this performance measure, we're probably the most, in fact, I think we are the most improved mainland board across Scotland. We also benchmark well across Scotland. So the Lanarkshire population is around 12% of the Scottish population. If you accept that around 2% of our patients are going to be treated within Glasgow, you would expect our share of the overall weights to be about 10%. Um, back in uh, a few years ago, uh, maybe 20, 2015, 2016, we were sitting at about 10% of the overall patients waiting over 12 weeks within Scotland. 
Our share of the outpatient weights um, has now fallen to its lowest in the last four years, and we've now only got 3.8% of the Scottish share of those weights. So I'm really proud of the progress we've actually made. I know it's still showing amber on your report, and I know there's more we can do, but I am pleased with the progress we've made in recent months, and that's been a lot of work with the whole team to deliver that. We're keen to sustain that improved performance, and to do that, we need to put in place programmes of redesign. So it's not just about having um, more and more patients being treated in the hospital sector. It's actually looking at the demand and looking at the pathways from primary care into secondary care and looking to see if we can do some change management around that. So if you have celiac disease, for example, you will now be seen by a dietitian. You might actually be seen in your, in your GP's practice as opposed to being seen in the hospital. So that then takes away the burden from the consultants, frees them up to see other patients. Equally, um, We've put in place a lot of virtual clinics, so learning from other sectors. So if you if you're in another sector, so take take the telephone, uh, take the banking service for example. They've they've affected a change from face to face, telephone, virtual. They've flipped that on its head, and that's what we need to do around many of our outpatient consultations. So moving away from that traditional, we will see you in our clinic when we have the paperwork and when it suits us. Actually, we could do a lot more virtually, and GPs are doing a lot of that work already. So we've got virtual clinics now set up in a number of specialties where people, where the consultants will actually just look at the patient notes. They don't need to see the patient. They can phone the patient if they need to. But we actually set that up as a clinic virtually, and we're seeing a, a, a big improvement in the numbers of patients we actually have to bring up to the hospital as a result of that intervention. So we're doing quite a lot of improvement work to try and change the demand on our services. I'm happy to talk for longer if, if that doesn't answer your question. We'll, we'll take Ross McGuffey and then perhaps we'll come. Emma will have. Okay. Yeah, good morning. Um, I, th I think the first thing I would say is we've got a really strong performance culture within, within the area. And if you take the, the health and social care partnerships as an example, we've got quarterly reviews that take place with each of the locality teams around performance. We've got quarterly reviews with the chief executive reviewing our performance. In North Lanarkshire, we've got both chief executives uh, in place, both the, the NHS board and the council, uh, scrutinising performance. We've got a really strong culture. Um, in terms of CAMS, historically we have been one of the better performing boards, but we have uh, in recent years uh, become under, under increasing pressure. I suppose in terms of the, the service pressures faced, demands doubled since 2012 uh, coming through the service. If we take just the last year, we've seen a 60% increase in urgent referrals, which clearly then has a knock-on impact in terms of the wider waiting list. Um, the, there's been a, a really positive direction of travel around um, the funding coming in. Uh, we had quite a number of, of temporary funded allocations which have been moved to permanent and we in, in year also moved a number of staff from temporary contracts to permanent ahead of those, those changes to try to bring a bit more stability to the service. Staff demographics is a, is a challenge for us. Uh, a really predominantly female workforce and quite a significant proportion of that um, in, in younger age. So at the moment we've got either um, off on maternity leave or just about to go off on maternity leave, 14 whole time equivalent out of a service of 113 whole time equivalent, so well over 10% of the service off on maternity leave at one time. And as we picked up in, in previous questions, recruitment uh, within CAMS is very competitive and based in the central belt. Um, that, that does drive um, a, a challenge in terms of recruiting, um, but also in terms of staff move. We have undertaken a deep dive exercise, which was led by our uh, medical director within the partnership. Uh, and that's come up with a number of actions which we've taken forward either immediately just now or, or, or across 2019-20. We've identified additional peripatetic posts to cover off areas where we have got significant staff absence through maternity leave, etc. Um, we have um, reviewed the number of, of team bases and we're looking to change the number of team bases um, across Lanarkshire to try best to improve the resilience of the service. Really significant work going on in the, around the neurodevelopmental pathway, which is one of the, the, the actions coming out through the National Task Force um, work. And there's been a lot of uh, national interest in terms of the approach we're taking, but that will see the, the development of a um, multidisciplinary team. Um, w w the North service will start off in May um, of this year, and that will see CAMS, PDA, um, paediatrics, SLT, etc., coming together in one integrated team uh, to provide a much more consistent service um, around neuro neurodevelopmental conditions. Um, and the, the other um, 
really key component here for CAMS is about early intervention. Uh, and, and the, the, the national drive through the task force is really welcome in, the, in, the, in that, that regard. And we'll be doing a lot of work through the two children's services partnerships in North and South, because I think that's an absolutely critical element um, in terms of CAMS is getting a much earlier level intervention um, in place to try best to provide much earlier supports. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your input. I'm just interested in that everybody's doing a lot of work around transforming care, getting people into primary care approach instead of secondary care, getting people out of hospital, discharge planning, all of that, which there's a lot of good work. And Callum talked earlier about uh, uh, plagiarising or getting ideas from other health boards. So. Is there like active work being pursued to look at what other boards are doing to address their waiting times and sharing best practice? Callum so, Yes. The reality is, I think uh, Mrs Knox summarised our performance, and I think a lot of that is a fair degree of plagiarism. Just last week, we had the review of our orthopaedic service, uh, and there was representatives from a number of boards there giving feedback on the day. Generally, it was positive, but there was some good things that came out from that. One of the challenges we had is we could probably go further with our virtual reviews, and that we're probably duplicating that because we operate on three different sites. They were saying, why don't you make your virtual centre one? So there were some good recommendations coming from there, and I think that was a consultant from Glasgow. There was one from the borders there. So we do challenge ourselves in that sense. I think one of the important points to highlight, though, is we do have a partnership agreement with, uh, we're, we're now a university board with Glasgow Caledonian and with UWS, but we've started to work now with Strathclyde University because one of the things we've recognised is the fact we can't continue to go forward the models of care we've got with the demographics we've got. So the fundamental challenge we're presenting with Strathclyde University is to say, how do we address health, ine health inequalities as well as look at how we match our workforce, because we've got about 10,800 whole-time equivalents. I think given demography, we're not going to continue to rise in numbers. So therefore, what are the models of care we will require going forward if we're fixed round about 10,800, but the demand in the service goes up? And that's a close collaboration with Strathclyde University trying to help us answer that question and give us appropriate workforce planning going forward. Very much, Miles Briggs. Thank you, uh, convener. I wanted to touch upon uh, preventative health again to go back because um, looking at some of the national trends, um, NHS Lanarkshire continues to have the highest prevalence of smoking within all of the health boards in terms of population, with 30% of the adult population smoking and 19.2% of pregnant pregnant women in Lanarkshire uh, reporting that they smoke. Um, so I wanted to touch upon, in terms of um, future smoking sensation programmes in Lanarkshire, but specifically uh, some of the innovative approaches which the health board um, have taken to date. And I know certainly um, the pilot project um, around uh, paying people to quit was one which Lanarkshire engaged. So I wondered just if you had any uh, feedback on that and how you're looking to address this problem, which obviously is still um, a high number of adults um, nationally. Thank you very much for that. I'll ask Dr Finlay to respond to, to that question. Um, Thank you. In 1718, uh, Lanarkshire's target was to achieve 1,220 12-week quits. Um, in the 40% most deprived areas. Our final position was actually 1,273 quits, so above target. Um, Lanarkshire's performance of 90% against the Scottish Government target was the third highest in all health boards. And we've also extended the overall Scottish performance by 9%. Along with this, the 12-week quit rate for 17-18 in the most deprived areas in Lanarkshire is 2% higher than the Scottish rate. And overall, we achieved 2,361 quits at March 2018. In terms of wider tobacco control, we've recently developed the Smoke Free Lanarkshire for You, for Children, Forever Lanarkshire Tobacco Control Strategy. And that provides Lanarkshire with a clear action plan which is in line with the direction of the Scottish Government's action plan. The vision of our strategy is to create a society for children which is smoke-free 
and where adults are positive anti-tobacco role models, whether they're smokers or not. So even if they can't quit themselves, they promote a non-tobacco use in our children. The key aim of our strategy is to protect children's health, to tackle inequalities and reduce the prevalence of smoking in Lanarkshire from 21.8% to an overall 11% by 2022. Um, so we look forward to reporting that trajectory as we go forward. And in, in terms of that work, I think specifically um, the high number of uh, pregnant women which were reporting smoking still um, in Lanarkshire was of real concern. I know I mentioned already um, the pilot projects. Um, is there any other work you're looking to do around that or what success have you had specifically within um, pregnant smokers? Certainly within our family nurse partnership, which tackles, ta tackles people who will have health inequalities. They work very closely with young mums. Um, to, to take forward smoking cessation. I would need to go away and, and look uh, for some more information on the rest of that. Though. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alec Cohan. Thank you very much, Convener. Obviously, delayed discharge is a problem across Scotland, and we um, as come up against this with any examination of a territorial health board. Um, can I just ask, um, in, in this scenario that will be familiar to many members of having constituents in hospital far longer than they need to be for want of adequate social care provision, um, what is the decision-making process, and who can knock heads together, if, as it were, between social care and primary care to, to make that happen? I'll ask Mr McGuffey to talk about um, the delayed discharge process and again just to say we knock everybody's heads together to make sure that this works because it's absolutely important that we get people out as soon as they are ready to go home. Uh, absolutely, I mean it's a vital priority for us as a, as a partnership and I suppose I was starting the fact we have taken this on a really whole system basis. So we've got an unscheduled care and delayed discharge improvement board, which covers both North Partnership, South Partnership, acute sector all together. And that is the, the planning vehicle for all unscheduled care and delayed discharge work within, within the partnership. So there's been a whole range of work uh, undertaken. I suppose the, the headline figures are that over the last year we've seen a 12% reduction in terms of delayed discharge bed days. We've seen an 18% reduction in code nine uh, bed days. Um, and so we are seeing some some moves going forward. I suppose the specifics that we've been taking forward, both the North Lanarkshire and South Lanarkshire partnerships have um, had their own um, home support strategies. So new models of home support that have really tried to focus on much more reablement and rapid response rather than run of the mill packages. And that's definitely starting to see uh, an impact in the, in the number of over three day bed day delays for home support has, has reduced really significantly across both partnerships as part of that, that rollout. But ultimately, that's, I suppose the real, real positive there is that having a rapid response reablement will have a much better impact for the individual themselves because in the longer run, we're maximising independence right at that point and hopefully reducing the overall uh, demand in terms of home support in, in the longer term. We've got uh, daily conference calls um, that, that take place between the partnership, uh, coordinating complex cases and significant cases. And within the two health and social care partnerships, we've got conference calls that do the same across health and social care to so make sure we've got sight of every every complex case on uh, in, in the hospitals and exactly how we're trying best to move those forward. Within the code um, nine patients, we've had quite a significant piece of work looking at the, the national um, protocol around that and that's a really significant impact. Uh, it would take probably 12 months ago, we'd be sitting mid double, mid double figures around uh, or mid teens um, around over 100 bed day delays for individuals going through the guardianship process. The national protocol is for that to take about 13 weeks, which is 91 bed days. Since uh, doing a bit of work on that, that includes a number of escalation points for when things get blocked. Um, at the moment, last week, we only had four over 100 bed day delays um, across the, the three acute sites in Lanarkshire. So that's seen a, a big improvement. And we're also now taking forward a test to change around guardianship applications where NHS will spot purchase care home beds to put the individuals in a, in a supported environment that's much more homely to allow them through that process, supported by the appropriate medical and MHO um, cover. There's been work in, in the um, acute wards around estimated date of discharge, um, and, um, and that, again, is trying our best to, to do it, that on a collaborative basis, so we'll get social work involved in, in the discussions much earlier. 
Um, and we've also uh, both undertaken in North and South reviews of intermediate care provision. And this is a critical one, I think one that we've started to get a real traction from, and that's looking at the off-site beds and the step-down capacity, but trying our best to get a much more rehab focus and reablement focus in those sites. Uh, and that allows the throughput back into a much more positive destination back into the community, um, but also then provides a step-down capacity that we require to support people um, down to stepping down from acute. And the, the last thing I'll pick up is um, a, a recent development as well around um, the rollout of uh, integrated teams. So we've got in, in North Lanarkshire, we've, we've integrated our rehab teams. So that took some physio hours from the acute sites, the community assessment and rehab service, which was acute based as well, disaggregated that into the, the localities um, and community, um, took the domiciliary physiotherapy and occupational therapy and social work occupational therapy into integrated teams. South Lanarkshire have got a similar approach in their in, uh, integrated community support teams. And what that has allowed us to do is create a rapid response vehicle. Um, and over the last uh, three weeks in North Lanarkshire, uh, we've supported 20 um, uh, early discharges home. So that was removing them from the process previously where they would wait for OT physio um, assessment on site to actually being supported home with a rapid rapid wraparound service, rapid access to equipment on the day um, to allow those assessments to take place in the community. And the big benefit of that is not just in terms of bed days for delayed discharge, but also in terms of the destination for the individual. Because if we can get people home much earlier, they deteriorate much less than they would um, sit in hospital. And the assessment will be much likely to be more accurate at maximising the opportunity to, to, to remain in their own home rather than um, ending up in institutional care. I think just to try and set the context, I'm going to ask Mrs Knox to say a wee bit about hospital home to put this in context, but it's important that well, Mr McGuffey talks about the reduction we've seen in delayed discharges both in North and South. That is because there is a strong partnership between the Health Board and both councils and the IGBs. But what we need to recognise is our emergency admissions have went up and our length of stay went down. We've, we've already touched on the fact we've a large deprived population to look after. So the system is under pressure, but the performance is good. But hospital home has been a real bonus for us. And I don't know if Heather could say a few words. Before, before, before that, I mean, I, I think it's important to say Ross McGuffey gave us some encouraging numbers, but the year on year figures show that the number of delayed discharges in Lanarkshire in January this year is higher than it was in January last year. So um, the numbers I have in front of me um, 3,488 bed days in January 2018, uh, 4,211 in January 2019. So I wonder if we could just understand the context of these numbers and, and how they contrast with the numbers so Ross McGuffey mentioned. The, the, the figures I gave you were for, for um, March to January, so the, the, which was our last um, ISD reported figure. So it was the, the cumulative in year total uh, compa compared to the previous year uh, um, over the same time period. But I'm simply comparing this time last or the exact same point in the previous year. And yeah, so, an uh, so I, I, I'm doing a, cu a cumulative March to January position rather than just the, 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 the January figure itself. Okay. Uh, I'll call him. Thank you very much, Camille. Thank you. I think that's probably one of the most comprehensive answers I've ever had to that question, Ross. So well done. Um, I obviously, you can still share the convener's concerns about this year's numbers. On that though there's obviously a corollary to this story which is the social care environment in your health board area and um, can you tell the committee a bit about capacity in that whether part of the problem as we've experienced in other parts of the health service is down to the fact that we can't get people out of hospital because there's just not either local authority provision or private commissioning provision available to, to cater for the packages of care that they need so, I mean, it's certainly a challenge across uh, both partnerships um, in terms of uh, recruitment. Again, the, the workforce issue in terms of home support can be quite quite challenging um, in terms of recruitment. Um, and I, I think while the, there's an impact there, I think the, the, the changes in models that we've been putting forward um, have actually had quite a quite a positive impact, and I think the the direction of travel we've set um, around just shifting that balance away from straight away 
into direct service provision to much more focus on an earlier, an earlier intervention and reablement approach uh, will have the desired impact. We've done quite a lot of, of research, um, for, for example, around the discharge to assess uh, models. We've been down to visit uh, different partnership areas um, in England uh, to, to review their models and the impact they've had. And what we have seen from other areas is that we can make quite a significant impact uh, through a much earlier intervention. And that's the, that's the direction of travel both partnerships um, are moving forwards with. If you take an example, the, um, it was picking up in terms of discharge to assess, we were looking at equipment. Um, the, the learning we've gained from other areas is the fact that when we, we do get in a much earlier intervention, get the individual out home on, on day, uh, in a much earlier um, part, while the equipment needs to go in on the day, which is a pressure for the, for the system, what we find is actually the number of, of, of pieces of equipment that are actually required actually shrink quite significantly. So there's a, a significant challenge in terms of the transition of that model, but we know the longer term impact of it will actually reduce demand. So that's really the direction of travel we're, we're, we're pushing. Well, you've talked about early discharges up and at the same time emergency department admissions are up. Is there a danger of people going out one door and in the next? I, I think that there's, a, there's a certainly an element here of actually building up the rapid response capabilities within primary care. And I think that the, the initial focus of us in both partnerships has been about developing that at the, for, the, for use for the back door. But in reality, what we need is those rapid response teams in the, in, in the community being able to pick up the front door element as well. Um, so we need to have that that rapid unscheduled care um, approach available in communities um, that, that actually negate the need to, to or, or certainly reduce the numbers um, going to the front door. Can you, maybe I can suggest Mrs Knox could expand on what we're doing at the front door, particularly to, to support that. Yeah, please. So just in terms of um, how we use hospital at home, if I could pick up that point first that Callum mentioned earlier. So our, our main focus really is around patient safety and doing the right thing for that patient at the right time. And we, and we try to stick to that. Now, that sometimes means that we have older patients who have dementia or have come in with an infection and have a delirium in our emergency department a bit longer because we don't want to move them around the hospital to various wards because it's very disorientating for them. And we have a service in Lanarkshire called Hospital at Home, which uh, has grown um, like Topsy over the last three years. Years, and we have a team that can come in and take many of these older patients home with that support. And it's a virtual ward environment, so they're actually having drips and infusions and, and a lot of care that we'd normally receive in a ward. They're under a consultant, but they're cared for in their own home. And we now, we now can support around 90 patients across Lanarkshire on any given day in that kind of environment. So that's, that's, that's one of the reasons why sometimes we have people waiting a bit longer in ED, but it's the right thing for that patient. Equally, our GPs, they refer, we were unique in Lanarkshire in that we have uh, what's called our ERC, which is our emergency referral centre. So the GPs will phone into a single point of access in Lanarkshire when they want to admit a patient. And that's unique across Scotland. It's actually something I was involved in setting up when I was a regional planning director many years ago. So that's quite nice to come back to that. But they've, they phone in and they're given the option of hospital at home at that point. So again, the GPs can refer the patient straight into hospital at home and our team will come out to the patient as opposed to the patient coming into the emergency department. So it's not just all about the numbers and the eight-hour waits and the four-hour waits. It's about the patients and what's the right thing for the patients. Okay, thank you very much. Brian Whittle. Thank you, Can I just ask a simple question really around the GP contract? I just wonder how supportive the GPs in Lanarkshire are of the new GP contract and all that that entails. Ask Dr Finlay to respond to that if she can. <laughs> how much time do we have left? <laughs> 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 so, uh, as you'll know, uh, only 30% of GPs voted uh, for the new contract, and only 70% of that 30% uh, actually voted for the contract. So, across Scotland, we're dealing with very small numbers, and we can, I suppose, think about the reasons for that. Within Lanarkshire, we have developed some very good relationships with our GP sub. Um, and they are very supportive and have signed off our primary care improvement plan. We also need to get round the GPs themselves. So we have cluster qualities, uh, cluster quality leads, um, who are GPs who lead quality within a number of practices for their area that we have very strong links with and are very supportive. I think for GPs at the moment, there's that tension be between sustainability and the old model of general practice 
towards what could be seen as the biggest change in general practice since 1948, so being much more involved with the managed service within their localities. So we're working through some of those challenges just now. However, they have mostly positively embraced it. We are seeing trust with our GPs grow in that where we have sustainability issues, people are coming forward at a much earlier stage to allow us to help them as a board. Well, just to follow <coughs> on for that, I wonder how you know the, the board monitor uh, the performance of the, sort of the GP practitioners and, and, and practices, and will the new contract change the way in which that is done? Yeah, that's a that's a big change for everyone. So the COF, which we used to use to monitor practices, went in 2016, and was replaced with the transitional quality arrangements um, and primary care indicators. And actually, when you, when you look at it on SPIRE, board officers can view the primary care indicators for their own board. Um, and, and that's something that stops us using that to monitor quality. And part of that, I think, was round about getting the trust of GPs and the quality leads, um, such that their data can be extracted and used centrally um, to help them improve quality. Therefore, as a board, we're kind of thinking, well, how the COF's gone? And we have we have nothing else in place yet. I, how do we do that? So prescribing, um, and Dr. Burns has already talked about that. Um, certainly, that can be looked at per locality, per practice, and per individual. Um, so that can be helpful. Um, complaints, which we don't like getting, but uh, we ask our independent contractors, not only GPs but the other independent contractors, to report on their complaints quarterly. <coughs> Excuse me. And the board also will now kind of mediate in complaints uh, at practices rather than it going straight to the ombudsman, although many times it often does go straight to the ombudsman. Um, there is SPIRE, which is uh, touched on previously, and that's about extracting data from GP practices. And our GPs in the, co in the clusters are working with list analysts to look at the data for their areas to think about quality. Um, as a board, we can look at Discovery, uh, which is run by NSS, and that lets us look at things such as referral rates, readmissions, and emergency department usage. And what we've done is we've set up one quality improvement programme round about that in one locality, where the GPs in that locality have agreed to look at these indices and work with us to reassure us and help us improve the quality there. We've got, as I said, good relationships with our cluster quality leads and our locality lead GPs, so, so that helps as well. And of course, there are a number of enhanced services and GP practices which are monitored by the board. Um, I was reading that uh, primary care in Lanarkshire is receiving the lowest uh, you know, total um, payment for its population uh, of all uh, territorial boards. I wonder if maybe you could expand on, on that. I wouldn't say yes, and if we can have more money, we'd, we'd, we'd like that. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Um, and I, I suppose it's as Mr Campbell said, you know, we, we use what we have got wisely. Um, we have the GPs increasingly integrated in both uh, IJB areas into the it's ICST teams, so integrated uh, community support teams in, in the area that I work in, um, such that we are maximising the use of the GP because some of that work is picked up by these teams to keep people at home. So it's really that full systems approach. If I, I'll, I'll let Brian in again <coughs> in a moment. It's certainly been suggested in the past that one of the issues in Lanarkshire is that people who in other parts of the countries might go to primary care in Lanarkshire might go to emergency departments. Is that still a feature that you would describe as, as an issue in Lanarkshire? I think it's a reasonable observation for people to make and I think one of the challenges you have in Lanarkshire is the fact that you've got three district general hospitals that are quite uh, close to population centres and therefore access to secondary care in that centre is relatively easy. And I think to make a comparison, if you take Aberdeen Royal Infirmary and compare the population use of Aberdeen Royal Infirmary for Aberdeen local authority in Aberdeenshire and compare it with North and South Lanarkshire, the reality is you're twice as likely to turn up at one in Lanarkshire. But I think it's as much to do with the geography and the close proximity of the hospitals to the population uh, that drives that. I think also a deprived population at times. But I, I dare say if we had more general practice, 
then that would help it. So I think it's a combination of issues. The other thing I'm really interested in within the GP is that, that GP cluster working and sort of the multidisciplinary teams that that, that, uh, that that are now developing. And I wonder if I could ask you how you, you prioritise uh, sort of the locality of, of, of planning planning sort of against sort of health inequalities in Lanarkshire. So, so thinking about the multidisciplinary teams yeah. and, and how we're, we're using them. Um, we have moved to a position when we are rolling out the resource that comes the primary care improvement plan that that is allocated on a locality basis. And we have taken the view that there will be a levelling up of services to try and start tackling some of those health inequalities um, so that the areas that are better resourced will get the additional resource later on. <clears throat> Within each locality, the locality lead GP, the cluster quality lead GP and the locality general manager are all involved in discussions about how that resource is best used within their locality. Such that if there's practices struggling or where there's pocket deprivation, then they would get the resource first and then it will level out over the, over the three years. Underpinning the whole um, primary care improvement plan, there will be an evaluation. And part of that, our GP colleagues have asked us to make sure that there's a fairness of allocation across the pieces, I'm sure you can imagine. And they're working with us to develop that as, as we speak. But it's a very new way of delivering um, general medical services. Um, so it's almost that partnership working as, as we go along. But with that fundamental, there will be a levelling up of services, um, certainly not a levelling down, so as that we've got a level playing field. If I could just ask one, one, one more question here, and, and I, I unashamedly put my hat on as the convener of the MSK and Arthritis uh, uh, cross-party group. Um, within within a, a sort of multidisciplinary team, we know that uh, about one in five people presenting at a GP practice is going to have some sort of MSK issue. Uh, and we'd also probably agree that, in most cases, a physiotherapist would be the best person to deliver that. There is a suggestion uh, that there is a shortage of that level seven physiotherapy for uh, sort of GP practices or GP clusters and, and the multidisciplinary teams, and that they are being they are moving from ho and the hospital environment into the GP environment. Is that the case? The, the robbing Peter to pay Paul. Um, certainly, it's a risk, and there's also a risk, as we've heard earlier, that you would train people up to, to level seven, and then they would move to other boards um, as well. So within Lanarkshire, we're looking at a grow your career in Lanarkshire approach, um, such that within the primary care improvement plan, we, we would have a range of physios working within general practice and making sure that's governanced and safe, so as that we are attracting people in that they can grow their career with us and ultimately have a career ladder up to that band seven. We're also working very closely with the enhanced service physios such that we might even work a rotational model and that is actually being, being worked up as we speak so I can't give much more information on that at the moment. So is that people are retaining the experience not only within primary care but also within the acute care setting and, and back out and that hopefully will improve job satisfaction amongst our physios as well. So as we're almost future-proofing that, that service, because there's no doubt if you have an MSK problem, you definitely want to be seeing a physiotherapist um, and these advanced physiotherapists, rather than necessarily going to your GP, where you probably end up with a prescription and, and maybe not much else. Oh, do you have enough? Sorry, I'm just... Sorry. <laughs> do, 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 just last question. Do you have are there, are there enough physiotherapists in the system? Certainly, sorry. So the short answer is no. It's one of our pressure areas. We had a conversation yesterday with the uh, University of the West of Scotland and we'll do some work with them to profile all the demands in physiotherapy and say, are there other professionals we can use to offset some of that work? Because physiotherapy posts are one that we are short of. Thank you, Convener. It's kind of on the back of Brian Whittle's questions um, because physiotherapists are needed for pulmonary rehab. And if you've got so many smokers in Lanarkshire, that's going to have a knock on effect for pulmonary ill health. And I declare that I am the cross party group convener for the lung health cross party group. So I have an interest in smoking cessation and pulmonary rehab and social prescribing as well for prevention of type 2 diabetes. So, so 
Tell me a wee bit about the success or benefits of social prescribing in NHS Lanarkshire, and do you have pulmonary rehab processes in place to deal with uh, your lung he ill health? Yeah, certainly we've got a programme in, North, in Lanarkshire called Well Connected, which is a social prescribing programme, and that includes a whole range of ailments from um, pulmonary rehab classes and, and wider um, fitness classes through um, things like stress control, um, anxiety management, mindfulness, a whole range of different um, programmes that are available um, to, uh, to GPs and also uh, through their own occupational health services, etc., um, for referral. Uh, it's an area that we're absolutely keen on developing uh, within both partnership plans and within the strategic commission plans. It's, it's areas we're looking at. I think the, the tech agenda within this is, uh, is absolutely critical as well. So the, there's been some great pilots in North Lanarkshire around home health monitoring. So if you, if you take respiratory um, as an example, where we've, we've got simple tech out with, with individual patients where they can use a pulse oximeter, text are reading back into the service, and they'll get an automated response. And if, it, if it's beyond a certain um, value, they'll get a text message back, giving them some advice, ask them to take another reading in 30 minutes. So they'll, they'll send the, 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 that back again. And as required, they can get a respiratory nurse out that day to see them at home um, where required. So I think the, the tech agenda in terms of enabling that is really important. Other examples um, I could give around um, the development of, of um, Making Life Easier, which is a portal used in North Lanarkshire, um, which pr provides self-management advice um, and also supported self-assessment um, and gives a range of uh, different op options for individuals in terms of being able to order simple equipment uh, for, th for their own home, but really allowing people to take control of their own condition, um, but also connect them in into service uh, where, where required, but not automatically. So they really try their best to, to support the individual to take control. Um, but certainly the, within both commissioning plans in, in, in North and South Lanarkshire, this is an area we're looking to develop around supporting people to, to take control of, of, of their own condition. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Sandra White. Very much, convener. I'll be pleased. Uh, good morning. It's still morning. We're pleased to know I'm not uh, cross party convener. Of, uh, not, I, I know of any any health so far. Of any uh, health, uh, but uh, other cross party groups as well. Uh, can I just say I, I'm, I'm really impressed with some of the figures and what you've said, particularly in the integrated, you know, teams and people being able to go out and getting support, etc. And I would hope that other health boards may take that on board. And I just wonder if the convener would indulge me, perhaps, if you were able to perhaps send us some papers in regards to, you know, for the delayed discharge and basically how when you get people out, how you support them, because it's something which I think is really, really important. And it's uh, as a personal matter for me as well. So it's personal, but it's not as a health, health matter and that. So that would be, that would be wonderful, thank you. But what I want to go into is basically we know that, you know, all the pressures that's put on, and one of the pressures, obviously, in your own area, uh, Health Board, is uh, the New Monklands Hospital. Uh, it's not just a pressure that comes in under, obviously, capital projects and, and monetary terms, but obviously the morale of the staff, I would imagine, too, in retaining and, and keeping uh, people there. Now, we know that, uh, well, I know that uh, it's quite a sensitive subject. It's out to public consultation. So I can't dig too deeply, a public inquiry, can't dig too deeply on that particular issue. But we have the two on board, Garkosh or Glenn Mavis, in that respect. And our report was supposed to be put forward in um, February this year. Could you enlighten us on where you are at the moment or is anything's moving without... <laughs> Maybe if I could respond to yes. that initially and then um, Mr Campbell can come in. So the first thing to say is that uh, you will be aware that an independent review has been commissioned by the Cabinet Secretary to look into the consultation process that we carried out in relation to um, a, a new Monklands hospital, the refurbishment or replacement of Monklands. Um, the independent review group were due to report at the end of February, but have recently indicated that they will now not report till the end of May. And therefore, you will appreciate that there is um, limited information that I'm able to share or it would be inappropriate to say too much around that. However, what I would want to say about the, the Monklands site is it's a key plank of our clinical strategy going forward. Having a replaced or refurbished hospital is, is absolutely part of that. 
Um, the hospital is now over 40 years old. Um, it is important that if we are able to deliver our clinical strategy going forward, achieving excellence, notwithstanding all the discussion we've had earlier on about attracting staff, retaining them, uh, enabling them to work in an environment which provides them with absolutely state-of-the-art facilities, then having that new hospital is, is absolutely crucial for us. But we do have some challenges, and you talked about staff morale, uh, and I will ask Mr Campbell to talk about some of those challenges, but one of the, the key ones is around um, the, the, just the physical environment of the building and the, the amount of backlog maintenance that we have. But more importantly, it means that within that environment, you cannot always deliver the services in the way that you would wish to deliver them. And I think that's the key bit of it. So it's not just about physical environment, it's about delivering those services in, in, a, in a manner that you would want to. So I, I think if you want to expand a bit more, perhaps, come on. Yeah, I, I think to try and set the context, first of all, between 1516 and 1718, NHS Lanarkshire took its backlog maintenance from about 53 million down to about 42 million. Broadly, that drop was because of the three new health centres. But of that 42 million that remains, eh, over 31 million of that is on Monklands. So there is a physical fabric problem on Monklands. I think we are the only board that's moving revenue to capital to try and maintain that. So it is imperative. We welcome the, the fact that there is a commitment to replacing or refurbishing Monklands. But we really do need to make progress with that quite rapidly. You quite rightly make the point, one of the issues we have is around recruitment of staff. Our nursing vacancies are greater on the Monkland site than on the other sites. It's not a it's not attractive and the uncertainties makes it more difficult to recruit staff. The functional suitability, I don't know if Dr. Burns wants to say it and briefly on that. I, I, I think that's right, and there is a contributory factor on the recruitment and retention of medical workforce at, uh, at Monklands Hospital as well. The, um, the, the functional suitability becomes challenged because of the, the, the old infrastructure within the building. Um, I, I understand, I'm not an expert, but I understand that the, the drainage system is, uh, is not conducive to the appropriate level of runoff. Um, and, and what that results in is the back flow of, of human effluent uh, is sewage uh, and that usually happens about once a year and that interrupts the delivery of, of safe patient care and that's extremely demoralising to staff working within those areas. It, um, it, throughout the rest of the year there are some real challenges with the fabric of the building and maintaining the appropriate HEI levels of, of um, hygiene that are required of us. The um, staph aureus bacteremia rate in Monklands is, is marginally high higher uh, uh, in comparison to our other two hospital sites. Um, that could be the, the, the patient case mix. It could be that that's more to do with the, the renal unit that has uh, that, that is there that has uh, contributes to that higher rate. But nevertheless, that's a consistent feature as well. So all of these things make it extremely challenging um, to, to maintain staff morale um, and the ability to deliver a high quality service. I would want to assure you that we've absolutely got mitigating actions in place to deal with that backlog maintenance and obviously are working very closely with staff, but to have some certainty going forward would obviously be very, be very helpful. Sandra Hart. A, a small, small up, and I hope that we come to a conclusion sooner rather than later uh, to serve the people of Monklands, because it, it's not just uh, you know, the area people have a great affinity for, you know where it is and that type of thing as well. Now there has been some controversy in how, uh, you know, basically you went about the public involvement in it. Um, in light of that sort of a controversy which appeared in the press, unfortunately, um, would you approach it differently if you had to do it again? So I think the Hopefully first. Not, but so I think the first thing to say is we will obviously learn any lessons that come out of the review. We welcome the review. Um, it is important that we consult and engage with our communities that we want to serve with this hospital. So, on reflection and hindsight, I think it's always something that you would reflect on and say, well, actually, could we have done that differently, and could we have done that better? So, uh, so hindsight's always a good thing, but I, I, I do await the outcome of the review, and we will look forward to implementing the recommendations to try and take this forward. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. And final questions uh, area is from Dave Torrance. Thank you, Convener. Uh, 
Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my, my questions are around uh, maintenance and infection control. Uh, can you provide information on what routine monitoring is undertaken to test for contamination, including water and ventilation supplies, uh, before uh, patients become infected? So I'll maybe ask uh, Dr Burns to comment on that. Yes, um, uh, the committee members may have seen our, our, our response in relation to the... Um, uh, the inspection of the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital and the recommendations that were produced there. Um, we have a, a long-standing Lancashire Infection Control Committee um, that has a number of subcommittees that report to it, and that's the governance structure for our, our healthcare environment. Um, and there's a number of standard procedures that have been in place through those subcommittees to give assurance to the Lancashire Wise Committee about how um, the uh, the the, the process for inline flushing, for example, within um, high high acuity areas is managed, um, and how the um, the integrity of the the environment is maintained um, at, on a regular basis. So there's quite stringent assurance there uh, provided to the committee. Can I ask, is the health board directly responsible for employing all cleaning and facility staff across all its sites? So um, we have three sites, two of them are PFI and the third Monklands is not. <coughs> so there's, there is a difference at, at Monklands Hospital where they are our staff um, and they are responsible for, um, for uh, the cleaning of the environment. Um, as we've indicated, it, it is challenging in, in given the fabric of the building in, in Monklands Hospital, and there are some challenges with recruitment of domestic staff in those areas. The other two hospitals being PFI hospitals, it's an output, an output specification that's required, and that's monitored again through our internal governance processes to make sure that that output specification is in fact achieved. I was, I was going to come at how much uh involvement do your infection control staff have in uh, monitoring maintenance and the different the cleaning methods across all your sites? So central to it. Yeah. They are central to it. Okay. And lastly, but not least, um, <laughs> you see um, you can infection control staff and specialist engineers, how much input will they have into the design of a new monthly hospital and the future maintenance uh, contracts of it? They were going to have a high role after the Queen Elizabeth issues, they will have a central role, and it, so I think I think similar to the point the chair made around uh, the consultation on Monklands, I think whatever comes out from that, we need to make sure the lessons are learned, we get the benefit from it, and we can give you that guarantee that we want to make sure we end up with a real state-of-the-art hospital at Monklands for to replace them, replace or for refurbish Monklands, and those design issues. Whatever they are, needs to make sure we're picked up with the engineers, etc. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Clearly, uh, you will know the evidence we took in this committee uh, on healthcare environment hazards. And one of the things we heard from witnesses was that infection control doctors were not always involved in the design of new buildings. So uh, it's certainly very reassuring uh, that you are planning uh, to take that directly on board. Can I thank the witnesses uh, for their evidence today? That's been uh, very informative and very helpful. Thank you very much. There are a number of things where I think you undertook to send us further information. Look forward to that. In addition, we will also, um, uh, on discussion, uh, identify any other areas where we might want to ask for supplementary information. And if so, we will, we will be in touch with you to that end. Thank you, thank you very much. We'll now suspend briefly and then resume uh, in private.